thank the Lord that uh, we have something here. And uh, thank the Lord for these wonderful families. Praise God. You know, I've been praying to the Lord that a bunch of new babies can come. <laughs> God is beginning to act like He does the He's beginning to answer prayer. So we're going to continue to pray for many, many babies. Seem to be thrilled. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how we that's how God grew a nation. Israel. We way to grow a church. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> you just don't have your heart in it. <laughs> well, thank God. It's just good to be with you this morning and to be here to worship the Lord together. If you have your Bibles. I'd like for you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8, reading from the King James Version. We want to encourage you to be out tonight, bring, bring visitors with you, our children's program, uh, musical and all is going to be tonight, beginning at 6 p.m. I would imagine that the children are all to be here no later than 5.30. Am I correct? 5 o'clock? <coughs> well, sometime after 5. And, Maybe uh, the older children's church, not the small. Okay, the older children's church here at 5? I'm not sure of that, but my, oh. my group is not to be here until about 10 to 6. 10 to 6? <laughs> You're ready, sister. <laughs> okay, at any rate, uh, I didn't know what time, so times they want them here early. But just be sure, parents, that you have your children here on time. 5.30. Okay, thank you, Brother Joe. 5.30 and uh, 10 till for Sister Gloria. And we're going to have a great program tonight. Don't forget, Wednesday night, Brother John mentioned it. We have our church Christmas party at the fire hall. We're just looking forward to a great time. And uh, we'll have that catered. That way we don't have to go in and cook. We can go in and enjoy. I think that's great. Amen. And then next Sunday morning, Sunday school, and then the adult choir will be making their presentation in the morning worship service. Bring visitors with you. Fill the church for the glory of God. And then next Sunday night, the youth choir. Am I correct on this? Somebody help me. The youth choir will be having their presentation next Sunday night. So we just have a, a great uh, services coming up and looking forward to a great time as we as we just give God glory for Christmas. Can you say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. So good to have all of you with us. A little scattered here. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have so many that are sick with the flu. We need to get them well so they can get out. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Beginning with verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. I like to stop there a moment because I've been in Israel twice. And where, where the place is where Jesus was born, you can see where the shepherds were from there. It's only approximately, as the bird flies, about two miles across the great chasm in the mountain. And over on the next mountain is Bera. That's where they graze sheep. That's where the shepherds were. Very interesting. We had a service. Uh, Brother Bill, is he here this morning? I remember. In fact, Bill spoke, didn't he? Did you speak about service? Were you afraid or something? You did something. Anyway, uh, we stood at the edge of that great chasm and looked across at the, at the fields that the shepherds were when the angel appeared. I thought that was really something. Amen. So I just thought that dropped me. No extra charge. Or anything. And lo, the angel, verse 9, lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace 
goodwill toward men. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless your precious, holy word this morning. We thank you for this great privilege to be in church. We're thankful, Lord, that we have this church uh, nestled in this little town that we can come to and lift up the holy name of Jesus. We thank you for this season, Lord. Give me wisdom. And Lord, let me be your channel. As I minister this message, I feel that you have laid on my heart for Christmas this season. Have your way, Lord, in this service. If there's one unsaved individual in this church, may they not leave here this morning until they have found Jesus Christ as their Savior. All these things we ask in your holy name. Amen. How could, my theme this morning is, how could I possibly, how could I possibly be happy at Christmas? How could I possibly be happy at Christmas? I like a poem that's written by Michael Dubina. He was a great poet. He, he wrote these words, Upon this holy Christmas day, I kneel with you to pray and give to you a gift of heart that will never waste away. But it cannot be tied with bows or placed beneath your tree. For it is broader than the sky and it is deeper than the sea. It is the love inside my heart I give to you today to comfort you and share with you the fortunes of your way. And if, dear heart, you give the same to please this heart of mine, we will exchange God's truest gifts to give at Christmas time. For when all other gifts are gone and you discard your tree and all the joys they brought to mind are lost to memory, the gifts of love that we exchanged upon the Christmas day will live forever in our hearts to light our life and way. I thought that was beautiful. A lot of people today, ladies and gentlemen, said in one way, a lot of people today don't have anything to give for Christmas. Nothing. They have no money. They have no means. And sometimes, you know, we, uh, we tend not to value that. I know that we do. But isn't it sometimes uh, uh, the way it is we don't realize that we have the means? And there are people that have nothing, but if they can give love, they give everything. I remember when I tried to buy my wife old my I talked about it in the bathroom this morning. Uh, pardon me. Um, but me and another guy was talking about it, one of our men. And I remember trying to buy for Rose. I, I thought, I'm going to be like other men. I'm going to buy dresses, <laughs> shoes, socks, and the other things that you buy. And I, I know that I can do it right. And I'd go out and I'd buy a dress, buy some new, not called socks, what are they? Hose or whatever they are. And some new shoes. I'd wrap them all up. You know, I wrap gifts like you wrap meat. <laughs> I'm not a good gift wrapper, but I, I just lay it down, roll it twice, put the ends in it, roll it again, then put a piece of tape on it. And I thought it was fine and put it under the tree and say, Merry Christmas, Rose. She'd open it up and be the wrong size, the wrong color, the wrong make. And everything I got was wrong. She appreciated me for trying, you understand? But you know, we had the means to do it, even if it was wrong. And sometimes I didn't appreciate that. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, there's some interesting factors that I want to share with you about this Christmas season. No other season of the year brings more joy and happiness, it seems, than the Christmas season. It, it by turn, just begins to bring joy into people's hearts. The lights go up all over town. You just put bows up everywhere. You just plaster stuff every place. And when your night comes, you can't wait until you turn the lights on. 
And it tends to bring a new, a new sense of joy to you. But for some this season, it will not be a joyful one. The reasons for this can be vast. For most, ladies and gentlemen, they will work very hard to get into the Christmas spirit. And as fast as they get into that spirit of the season, just as quickly, they will lose it. I think one of the primary ingredients of a successful Christmas holiday is happiness. Now, I want to share something with you that I feel the Lord's laid on my heart. The Bible talks a lot about joy, but it doesn't say a lot about happiness. And there is a distinct difference. I think the Bible says a lot about happiness, it just doesn't use the word happiness. First of all, if you're taking some notes this morning, before I can go any further, I've got to consider the word joy. You see, ladies and gentlemen, joy seems to be motivated by specific times or situations. On Christmas morning, you're gonna, your children are going to open their gifts. They're going to be, they're going to be laughing and they're going to be happy and you're going to be opening your gifts that your husband got for you and uh, and uh, your husband's going to be opening the gifts that you got for them and and uh, oh, it's just going to be papers going to be flying everywhere. But I don't know about you. <coughs> About four or five hours into the day, everything settles down. You put the unwrap, the, the, after you've unwrapped the gifts, you put them back under the tree again, and, and, and then you've got to pick up the paper. And you've got to take the vacuum cleaner and clean the floor. And so the joy seems to go. You know, if somebody else could come in, throw the paper away, clean the floor, get everything tidy again, and I could just sit and play with my toys. Gun, I'm a, I'm, I've asked for a new gun. I'm not going because i got to tell you this. We're, I guess I'll argue. We're, about, we're, we're uh, giving gifts out down home, uh, and we passed out names, and you're supposed to put on the three things that you'd like. <laughs> I just wrote on mine a new gun, or a new car, or a new bow and arrow. I said, what? What would you do? I said, you never know where you should go with that. You never know. It's only supposed to be about 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't got to get on. You see, see, joy seems to be motivated by specific times or situations. A wedding. I just had one here Friday evening. A couple stands before me, all starry eyed. Looking at each other and tears rolling down their cheeks. Tears of joy. They told me that. The, the young lady sobbed and said, This is, these aren't tears of sadness. They're tears of joy. I said, I was sort of hoping that. <laughs> How about a, a baby is born? But it's your first child. And you've been looking forward to that new, brand new baby. What a joy. A gift is received. Relatives visit. A loved one is given a second chance at health. These are things that motivate joy. But ladies and gentlemen, this morning, what about happiness? You see, happiness seems to demand longevity of time. You don't get happy for a minute and then get unhappy. You can be full of joy for an hour and then lose it. But when it comes to happiness, it's something that take, it may take years to build. But it's just as hard to lose. Happiness seems to demand longevity of time. It is an instant, nor does it just go away at the drop of a hat. 
So this morning, this Christmas season, how could I possibly be happy at Christmas? I'm going to share with you, to try to understand this, three types of happiness that the Lord laid on my heart. Number one, there is carnal happiness. Carnal happiness. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 says these powerful words. For though we walk in the flesh, now I want you to notice those words, because Jesus seemed to imply to us, be in the world, but not of it. How many have ever read that scripture? Jesus said to His world, words, be in the world, but not of it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what does that mean? Why did the writer use that terminology, war after the flesh? And I feel the Holy Spirit laid the answer on my heart. Don't exhaust spiritual effort on carnal things. Some people are not happy unless they get. And get. And get. And get. You see, ladies and gentlemen, verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, are, carnal, yeah, are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Here it is, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want you to remember this if you remember nothing else. Now you might say when this message is done, Pastor Thomas doesn't believe in getting things for Christmas. Oh yes I do. I believe that if they want to give it to me, I'm going to receive it. There was a day when I did I thought if it didn't work for it, I shouldn't have it. But God has spoken to me about that and said, don't ruin a person's blessing. If they give you something, accept it. How many can say amen? amen. Accept it. Because if you don't, you can ruin their blessing. And sometimes I still feel like I've got to repay people. I've got to give them something back for what they give to me. But giving is not that. Giving is giving without receiving anything back in return. Can you say amen? That's a, that goes for me. And I hope that this Christmas I can give, if nothing else, give my heart to you. And not take it back. Let you have it. My happiness cannot be based on what I attain in this life. This is karma. And it is very temporary. I cannot base my happiness. That's why you got to remember, you can be joyful at a new house. You first walk into the brand new place. I remember I built a new home for Rose. Uh, and I just happened to be able to live in it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not Rose, I'm really kidding all this stuff. I better be careful. i got to go home. I remember building a new home, and we moved into it. And Oh, man, it was just something. Brand new floors, brand new carpet, brand new, brand new windows, all the appliances, brand new. The paint smelled brand new. Everything, it was beautiful. And what a, what a nice thing it was. But you know, you know the joy faded. Once you had to try to keep the carpet clean and wash the window and keep the appliance, grease off the appliances, the joy faded. Oh, what a, what a powerful thing it is. What a powerful thing it is when you can live in that house and be happy. You see? Can you see it there? Oh, there's the difference. I really believe this morning that if I base this Christmas season just on things, I'm going to be a very, very miserable individual. Number two, if I'm to understand what happiness means, I must also consider another type of happiness. First of all, there is carnal happiness. Secondly, there is gracious 
happiness. <coughs> Gracious happiness. Turn with me if you want to follow Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 10. I think it says it far better than I could ever say. Before we read the scripture, I'd like to read a little poem by Catherine Jennison Irvin. It goes like this. I want to tell you a little story this morning. Loved ones all around us, hearts and eyes aglow. Kind and loving neighbors, sleigh bells in the snow. Mistletoe and holly, toys beneath a tree, make such sweet reminders of Christmas time to me. A smile upon a baby, a kitten with a bow, precious little blessings which heaven can bestow. Greetings from far places to brighten each abode, and a newborn Savior to lead us down life's road. I'd like to tell you a little story. I asked if I could do it. I went up to visit, as I did many folks this week, uh, Sister Roby, Charlene Roby. Some of you new families wouldn't know her, but uh, she has been in our church for years and years, and her husband has passed away a few years ago. Dear people, I went up to visit her. She's had a stroke, and she's still getting around pretty well, but she has her difficulties. <coughs> And as we were sitting there talking, she said, Pastor, I've got to tell you a story. And she said, if you want to pass it on to the congregation that fit very well here, you can. She said, one of my dear friends has a dear friend. And that dear friend of my dear friend <coughs> lost her husband four weeks ago. And I just, <coughs> my friend said, she just, Watch this woman fall apart. And one day, Sister Roby's friend was had to go to the pound. Is that what you call it where they have animals? Pound? For some reason, I don't know why. And she saw this pretty light brown cat. Big and fat. Declawed, de everything else. <laughs> All prepared for the family. House broke. There was a, a litter box with her and there was all kinds of cat food with her. And the friend of Sister Roby said, something inside me said, buy that cat and take it to my friend. And she did. And in these last two weeks, that lady has fallen in love with that cat, and the cat has fallen in love with her. And Sister Roby said, Pastor, and she has to think before she speaks a good bit now. She paused and she said, Don't you think that's what Christmas is all about? I said, Yes, it is. She says, all she did when we sat there the other day, she talked about her husband. She misses him. <coughs> Folks in this church this morning that miss your, your husband or wife, I know you. This is a tough time for you. But ladies and gentlemen, there's gracious happiness. It's a giving of something that God lays on your heart. You say, well, that's not very spiritual to give a cat. But I tell you one thing, animals can become dear friends. How many know that? They can become a dear friend to someone who is lonely. And I thought that was a beautiful story. And I wanted to share it with you this morning. I want you to notice Philippians chapter 4. Uh, beginning with verse 10. This is St. Paul speaking. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but lacked opportunity to do it. You know, Paul was in prison a good bit of his ministry. And when he was in prison, he couldn't receive things that people would send. He couldn't receive it. They wouldn't accept it. And so as long as he was in prison, he couldn't receive any help from his fellow prisoners. Not that I speak in respect of what. For I have learned in whatsoever state 
I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. I'm teaching on this scripture on Wednesday nights. Both to abound and to suffer need. But he says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Can you say again? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What is gracious happiness? My home makes me happy. That's gracious happiness. My family makes me happy. Contentment is happiness. I like to tell this if I may. It may affect you, it may not. But I talk to lots of people and they say after they get married, they start gaining weight. I shouldn't have said that. I just know it now. But it's the truth. You know, for years and years, not years and years, but 21 years, I weighed 130 pounds. Never could gain a pound. Never lost. I ate like a pig. <coughs> Never gained a pound. But after I got married and got settled in to that marriage, I started gaining weight. <coughs> ate the same way. Now, what is that? Somebody tell me out loud. What, what's the cause for that? Contentment. Sure is. That's the only thing I can find. I mean, I didn't change my eating, eating habits any. I hear a lot of talk. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, I believe it's contentment. Having, when before you didn't have anybody, I remember living in a, in a little room working near Washington, D.C. by myself. <coughs> time I brought the car and parked it, somebody stole something off of it, and I couldn't have anything. Every time I bought new hubcaps the next morning, they were stripped. I couldn't have anything. Stayed in that little room. I remember that little cubby hole. I used the lady's bathroom. She owned a house, and she rented this room out for $20 a week. And I got to use her bathroom, stay in my room. From the moment I come home from work, I had to stay in that little 10 by 7 or 10 room. It was so little, a little uh, cot, and that was my life. But after I got married, I got to come home to a lady. <laughs> Supper on the table. We could sit together in the living room and talk and enjoy one another. Things changed. I had something to come home for. You act like you're really unhappy. <laughs> I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Amen. Amen. To me, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. That's gracious happiness. It, it's a kind of happiness you, do, you, don't, you don't come on in a second. You build it. You work at it. You tolerate things to get to it. And you moan. <laughs> there seem to be more feminine voices than male. Uh, you, you, you moan into it. That's where ha happiness comes. You see, contentment is happiness. Caring is gracious happiness. Caring. God's goodness to me is gracious happiness. So listen, ladies and gentlemen, wherever I am, this is what Paul said, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, deep down, I'm happy to be there. That isn't like our society today. Our society is very difficult to please. If you can have a happiness in Jesus Christ this Christmas, that brings contentment to your soul. How many can say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Thirdly, and last, if I'm to understand what happiness means, not only must I consider carnal happiness, gracious happiness, but then there is a God-given happiness. In Acts chapter 26, we read about it. I like Paul's words here. I'm going to read the first chapter 26 of Acts, verse 2. 
And then I want to go all the way over, if I may, to verse 27 through 29. Acts 26, King James Version, verse 2. I think myself, here's one place where I find that word. I think myself happy, King of Ripple, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. I have to look at that, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you, Paul had very little to be happy about as far as this world was concerned. From the time that he gave his life to Jesus Christ, he lived, he lived a life of, of criticism, of physical pain and torture. No one knows for sure how much he went through. At one point, in one prison, it's listed in history that his hands were, were uh, in, in steel braces and his hands were lifted high enough to where just a little weight was lifted off of his feet. And he was left there hour after hour after hour after hour. Rats. No heat. No windows. No light. Dampness. And yet... He was taken out of prison, taken before Agrippa, and he said these words, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Verse 27 says this, King Agrippa, Believest thou the prophets? He had an opportunity to preach the word. Now back in those days, they didn't have the Bible like we do, the, the 66 books, but they did have writings that were written by various prophets. And he said, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, O most thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God, I like this one, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. Do you think Paul was talking about, I just wish everybody was putting stocks like me. Think that's what he was saying? No. Do you think he was saying, I just wish everybody could live two-thirds of their Christian life out in jail? No. He said, I wish everyone could be born again, saved from their sin, and set free by the power of God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's God-given happiness. You cannot be happy in this society unless you're born again. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, your Christmas will go down the drain like every other Christmas has gone. Unless you find Christ as your personal Savior. That's the only way to find happiness. I want you to know that when I speak of God-given happiness, I speak of born-again happiness. I speak of Holy Ghost Spirit-filled happiness. I speak of the knowledge of God, happiness. There's nothing that brings more happiness to my heart than to study the Word of God and learn more about Jesus. It brings more joy to me than anything else in the world. I used to think as a young man that cars were all my happiness. And I told you about the 53 Chevrolet I had. And you know, I, I wasn't well to do when I was a kid. And uh, I had that old car, but I'll tell you, just because I took it out, I got to do something to make this car look good. And I took white paint and painted. I didn't have enough money for hubcaps. So I, I just painted, spray, spray painted the wheels on that 53 Chevy Coupe. Kept a lot of wrenches around. So when the valves would come loose, the rocker arms about every 300 miles, tighten them down. I put a, I put a Hollywood muffler on her. How many's ever had a Hollywood muffler? Oh, they sound good on a six cylinder. Well, they sound good, and I wasn't quite satisfied with that. So I saved and saved and bought a split manifold. 
How many's ever had one of those on a six cylinder? Boy, you were you were top of the line <laughs> when you had a split uh -huh. Top of the line. And boy, I'd take that thing all the smoke would be pouring out the top of the motor up through the cab. I couldn't see through the windshield for the smoke coming out of the motor. But oh, I was the top of the line. I had what I wanted. I thought that was happiness. And I'll tell you what I really found happiness is when I found the Lord. That's when I found happiness. That's when all my fears were dissipated. That's when all my confusion seemed to stop. That's when I finally found a place where I could hide in the rock. Yeah. And no matter what came my way, I didn't have to live in fear. I didn't have to be worried about fleeing away from it. I had, I had a God who rock is higher than I. The solid rock, Jesus Christ. And he brought happiness to me. And now today, things are completely different with me. I'm happy. I can wear the same pants five days. I can wear the same shirt till it just holds. I do. Bruce, I come in from hunting, and I couldn't find the hunting clothes. There was blood all over. But I said, I, I, I brought them in. She says, I threw them away. I said, what you throw them away for? There's nothing left in the yard. She said, everything's good. She said, how do you stay warm? I, I said, I'm beginning to feel comfortable. <laughs> Today, it doesn't take a new pair of shoes every week to make me happy. It doesn't take a new suit every day to make me happy in Jesus. I got the Lord. He's my happiness. The Holy Ghost is my strength and His blood. Is my salvation. I need nothing else. <coughs> by his stripes. How many can raise your hands? By his stripes. I am healed from disease, from sickness. How many can stand on your feet this morning and say, God healed me of disease? Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed of it. Just stand on your feet. God healed me. God. God healed me eternally. Eternal. Let's give him a good day. Hallelujah. You can pick people up off the road like David with bones sticking out all over his body. Not really giving his life to Jesus. He's sitting on the back pew in that motorcycle accident. And now God put the bones back in place. God put him together and let him walk again and think again.